How do you work another station in another country that's on a completely different band plan? What's the best portable battery to fly with? And how do we spot a fake power pole connector? This time on Mailbag Monday. What is happening, everyone? Thank you so much for tuning in to KMRD Radio Stuff. My name is Mike. If you have an amateur radio-related question for me, shoot me an email. KMRD at iCloud.com. Just put Mailbag Monday in the subject. Guys, we've got three great questions for you. So without any further ado, let's dive right in. First, we've got a question regarding working other countries that have different band plans. So this viewer is asking, are you aware of any multinational amateur radio frequency chart overlays that will show what amateur radio frequencies are legal in other countries and how they compare or overlay with U.S. legal frequencies? I got into a discussion with an amateur colleague from South Africa who was explaining that their legal bands are different from ours. And if he and I wanted to make a contact, we should select a frequency that is legal for both of us. I did some research and indeed found that in Spain, their legal 20 meter, I think it means 40 meter here, uh, band only appears to span 7 to 7.2 megahertz. This means that if I'm calling a CQ between 7.2 and 7.3, I won't get a legal response from Spain. Correct. Uh, so, no, I'm not aware of anything uh, that, that kind of shows uh, the differences in our band plans. Uh, but I do know that uh, some of the European countries only go to 7.2 megahertz on the 40 meter band. And uh, really, there, you got one of two options really that, that come to mind. One, you can work in that 7.175 to 7.200 uh, frequency space there, but that's kind of limiting. Those those slots are usually pretty busy. Here's the loophole, though. This is one great reason why your radio does split. Okay, so what is split? Well, split is a way to operate where I'm going to transmit on one frequency and I'm going to listen on another. Your local repeaters do exactly this. That's that offset. So let's say your friend in South Africa is on, let's say, 7.150, okay? Now, if you're an extra, you can just go down to 7.150. But let's say you're a general. You can only go to 7.175. Well, regardless, your friend in South Africa can be anywhere where it's legal for him. It's not illegal to listen. So if he's on, so let's say I know in Australia, uh, I believe 7.074, which is the FT8 frequency, they actually have phone down there. Well, we can't make a phone contact here. That's just not what we do. But by using split, if I'm going to listen, let's say he's on 7.110, okay? That's outside of the phone portion for the U.S. But I can listen on 7.110, and I can transmit on, say, 7.250 where he is going to listen on 7.250 and he's going to transmit on 7.110. So simply putting your radio into split mode and adjusting the frequencies accordingly is, is going to work around that entire problem. Now, as far as a chart showing multiple frequencies and countries, yeah, I think that would be uh, rather helpful. I looked on the internet, couldn't find anything. So my challenge to you is make one. Make it available. I think that's a great idea. So uh, split operation is really the, the solution here again. And uh, I hope you make a lot of contacts with your friend in South Africa and, and elsewhere in the world. So good question. Thanks so much for writing in. Next, we have a question about portable batteries and flying. This viewer asks, I'm going to be picking up my first HF radio, a G90. Fantastic. Love my G90. Uh, I'll be grabbing a BioNO battery. Good choice. My question is, what kind of charger should I get for the battery? I'm new to battery operation and will be bringing it back with me from the U.S. to New Zealand. Can't make this easy. <laughs> this actually isn't that hard. Any suggestions for which battery I should get and what charger as well that will work with 110 and 220? You're on your own on that one. Uh, bonus difficulty <laughs> will need to be taken on uh, carry-on internationally, so needs to be under 100 amp hours. So first off, let me correct you, 100 amp hours is a ginormous battery. So first off, kudos for wanting a BioNO. I, I absolutely recommend BioNO. And depending on how long you actually want to transmit, I use a 6 amp hour with my G90, uh, which for phone is fine. For digital, I find myself wanting more. Um, so 
depending on how you're going to pack it, uh, I would say maybe go definitely bigger than a 6 amp hour battery. But uh, I want to state that I am not a lawyer, so do your own research. But per the FAA.gov website regarding flights with batteries, with airline approval, passengers may also carry up to two spare lithium ion batteries, 101 watts to 160 watts, or lithium metal batteries, two to eight grams. So basically what that means is if we take 12 volts, divide it by 160, we get 13.3 amp hours. So a 12 amp hour battery is the largest that you can carry, and it must be carry on. You can't check these things, but you can carry two. So if you really wanna go crazy, you can get two 12 amp hour batteries and fly totally fine. Now you need to check with New Zealand and see if, if I guess if you're flying an American flight home, you're kind of under American rules. I have no idea how that works. So do your due diligence and, and figure out the legality of that. But a 12 amp hour battery, whether you're running digital CW phone with that G90, you'll be on the air for a while. Now, as far as chargers with 110 and 220, I got nothing for you. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a unicorn right there. But uh, you'll, have, you'll have to get some kind of boost converter for 220 or something, I guess, in New Zealand. But uh, I like the Bioeno chargers. They're, they're simple. Uh, you can get a 2 amp hour charger. That'll take, obviously, six hours to charge that up or get a 6 amp hour charger and uh, or 6 amp charger, excuse me, and, and that'll charge it in just a couple hours. So I use a 2 amp with my 6 amp hour battery. Uh, just fine. I do also like the high tech that I use that will take a DC input. So if you have another DC source, although it's not 220, you could plug it into a 12 volt power supply and charge that way. So uh, you might not need in New Zealand, you don't have 110. Um, so you still wouldn't be able to do 220 off of it, but you could charge it off of 12 volts. So just 12 volt to 12 volt. And there, there's a little bit of a boost converter in there to go up to 14.6 for lithium iron phosphate. But that would be a good workaround, the high tech. I'll, I'll leave links uh, for all this in the description so you can take a look at them and pick them up if you need be. But that would really be the solution. 12 amp hour uh, battery. I think I would actually say get that high tech charger. Uh, that's tip, that is my main charger that I use. I, I have quite a few chargers, but um, the, the high tech is definitely the one I like the best. So. Uh, that, that actually would be my official answer is get that high tech, uh, take a look at that. So, uh, and, and have fun and safe travels and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, thanks for writing in. Great question. Lastly, a very near and dear question to me because everyone knows how much I love the Anderson power pole. This viewer asks, hello, Mike. Hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you. Hope you're well as well. Yes. I have a quick question. Are there Anderson power pole knockoff connectors that I need to steer clear of? I found a number of Anderson-like power connectors that come up when I do an Amazon search, which I assume don't have the same quality and fit. So yes, they're absolutely 100% are knockoff Anderson connectors, and they are littered all over Amazon, uh, including, I believe, PowerWorks. Uh, PowerWorks is not uh, legit Anderson either. I believe I've ordered some of those. So let's hop over on the workbench. I'm gonna show you the differences so you can see for yourself and be a little more learned. Two of these are fake, and only one of these is real. How do we spot the difference? Well, there's actually quite a few ways if you have a discerning eye. Now, it doesn't show up on camera very well, but the genuine power pole is actually a little bit more of a richer, darker red. That's one way to spot it if you've got a good eye for color. I'll tell you right now, this is the real power pole. Okay, and there's a few features that we can look at to distinguish them. They're, they're not that easy to notice, but if we look at all three of them, well, the first, the dead giveaway here, let's look at the A, also the two circles on top, okay? The middle one is the real Anderson power pole. Notice how the A pretty much goes from the top of the lip to the bottom, it's like a good capital A. And the circles are very nicely defined. Whereas the two on either side, and I believe there's three different brands here. So the, the actual Anderson is in the middle. And then there's two counterfeits, uh, two different counterfeits on either side. And notice the circles just look kind of haphazard. Look at the A on the right is really small. The A on the left is a bit bigger. 
that's kind of the dead giveaway. You look for a nice clean circle on the front and a nice capital A that goes all the way up. On the backs of these, this is probably the least noticeable one. But if we take a look at how this part right here is, it's, it kind of makes a triangle going up, okay? This one doesn't really have it at all. And this one is more of a square, okay? So we're looking for that more triangular from the base, it's wider, and at the top, it gets a little narrower, okay? If we go to the top of them, and we look specifically at these grooves, how they're supposed to mate with one another, okay? Let me zoom in a little bit. Both of these are pretty square. This one is round, okay? So dead giveaway that that's a knockoff right there. They don't actually mate with one another, okay? They, they don't even fit. One's square, one's round, and they, they don't fit at all, okay? But between the two square ones, and these ones I think actually will mate together, yeah, they mate together. If we look at this square part here, specifically in front of it, Notice there's a difference on the genuine Anderson power pole. There's kind of this bit of, there you can kind of see it, this, this little bit of extra square that's pretty much flat, but it, it, it extends beyond this little coupling part where the knockoff does not have that at all. So just looking at the tops of these, you can tell you've got a, a big square part here and then there should be another little jut out there. Okay, that's a dead ringer. And then looking at the A and the circles is really, I mean, and the color. The color is gonna be the, the hardest one to spot. That is kind of three different, four different kind of defining characteristics of how to spot a genuine and a fake. Now, buying on Amazon, they probably take a legit photo of the genuine Anderson. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't typically buy from Amazon. I have in the past, obviously, that's why I have these, but I typically will get my Andersons uh, directly from DX Engineering because I can trust them. So now you know. And there you have it, guys. Don't be fooled by counterfeit Anderson power poles. DX Engineering is really the only place I know uh, that's reputable to get Anderson power poles. I'm not affiliated in any way. That's just where I get mine. So get them there. Uh, guys, thank you so much again for watching. I do appreciate it. And again, if you have questions for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. Just put Mailbag Monday on the subject, and maybe your question will be featured on an episode of Mailbag Monday. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can also follow me on Twitter at k8mrd, and we'll see you again on another episode of k8mrd Radio Stuff. 73, guys.